Um, today we will continue with a bit more uh, study of assignment expressions and uh, after that we will move on to managing control flow between statements starting with you know if then else and then the switch statement. So we will repeat a little bit of material from basic assignment so that if anything is unclear you should raise questions and then we will look at a couple of new kinds of assignment statements. So a typical simple statement in C++ will compute the value of an expression as the right hand side and then assign that value to a variable on the left hand side. For now because we have only seen basic variable types like int, float, character, the left hand side always has to be a variable name. You cannot assign to a constant, you cannot assign to an expression that does not make sense. When later on we start looking at arrays very soon and then uh, somewhat later more complicated data structures like two dimensional matrices or queues or lists or trees, then the left hand side can look far more complicated. But for now the left hand side should be a simple variable name Then that is the kind of statements you have seen all along so far. Now these numeric types that we have studied and then the character types they can be combined into various arithmetic and boolean expressions we have seen that already. Uh, for example to swap two numbers you declare a temporary you assign it to one of them and then do the switch. Then there are these more complicated arithmetic expressions and we have seen that expressions are built out of operators. Operators are like plus minus star slash multiply and divide and the way you write down the expression decides the order in which evaluation happens. There is an implicit uh, precedence between operators as specified by the language manual and there is a link in the web in the course website to the C++ standard manual. So you can look up the respective precedences of operators. How tightly do operators bind to the operands or the arguments which are being passed to them. So if you say the second expression 5 times Fahrenheit minus 32 over 9 without brackets that would lead to the middle expression tree. If you want it to be the correct conversion from Fahrenheit to centigrade that is the first expression you have to write it down as the first line and that will translate to a completely different expression evaluation tree. So inside the compiler when you write down an expression the first job the compiler does is to scan that string you have typed and turn it into this kind of an expression evaluation tree. After that the leaf nodes are either constants or their variable names. These variables are fetched from memory into registers or constants are loaded into registers and then information flows from the leaf of the tree upward toward the root. Okay. So as evaluation happens intermediate nodes and edges carry values and eventually the root value is the value of the entire expression fine. So that is the rule of evaluating expressions and then finally when the expression is evaluated it can then be assigned to the left hand side variable. The third uh, expression and its corresponding tree gives you one of the roots of a quadratic uh, equation some of you will cover in this year uh, this week's lab. There are also logical operations which you build up by inserting um, relational operators between numeric types or integer types or character types. For example you can test if 5 is less than 13 which evaluates to true or you can test if 10 to the power 5 is greater than or equal to 2 into the power 6 which is false. Uh, if you want to test for equality that is 2 equals instead of 1 which is an assignment or you can also test for inequality by saying not equal to. Now one of the things you need to be careful about is when you are comparing floating point numbers test for equality and test for inequality are tricky you need to do the right thing depending on the situation. We will see one example of that today. Uh, each such expression a logical expression is either true or false. So when I said that C++ supports boolean values by faking it using ints that was correct internally but ANSI standard C++ actually does support a bool data type BOOL and you can declare a variable as a bool the constants true and false are defined so you can use all of them except that internally it is immediately represented as an integer and you are allowed to you know, abuse interconversion between integers and booleans. So it is just a language support internally it is not strictly separated from the type of integers. Uh, operators have their own precedence rules just like numbers for example and binds more strongly than plus uh, than or. So the expression you see over here I will just write it down copy it down here looks like that and the corresponding operator tree is as follows suppose I take just e less than equal to f the value e 
flows in the value f flows in into a relational operator which compares the two and remember the thing flowing here is an int or a float or a double let us say int but the thing that floats out of here is a bool okay and that goes to a not operator this is a not operator and that of course also outputs a bool according to the rules of boolean algebra okay now the next thing that happens is on this side well it's not in this order actually uh, a is compared to b plus 1 Th these are arithmetic operators so the incoming values are say float uh, ints or doubles or floats and then this is also say an int a goes in say as an int it could be a float in which case it will be converted and then the equality operator tests if they are equal that outputs a bool okay meanwhile the second subtree looks at the values c and d and applies a relational operator not equal to here so this test outputs a boolean again out of this expression now there is a choice there are two operators and an or and and binds tighter so the and happens first that outputs a boolean in turn and this gives you an or and these combine to give the final boolean value out of the root okay so that is the expression tree corresponding to that logical expression any questions so you can read the rules of what binds harder than what operator in the c++ manual and if you are unsure you can always use brackets to enforce what you want so to be safe if you are not with the manual at the moment always put brackets so that the intended meaning is implemented and why are logical expressions useful so far we have been computing only with numeric or character expressions logical expressions are used to control the execution of statements which we will start today now how do you assign values to variables as I started out saying it is pretty simple you compute the value as the right hand side then you say left hand side equal to right hand side for now the left hand side is just a variable name and the right hand side has to be an expression compatible with the type of the left hand side okay and as we saw in a previous lecture you have to be careful of the implicit type of the right hand side because you might say you know float f equal to 7 slash 3 and 7 will be interpreted as an int 3 will be interpreted as an int 7 slash 3 will be interpreted as integer division which results in 2 and then that will be assigned to the floating point number as 2.0 so it, while doing assignments you need to understand the type of the left hand side and right hand side fairly well okay the main new material for today is what we call compound assignments or assignments with side effects and so on uh, and uh, incrementing assignments so suppose our uh, spec is that we have to read two numbers from c in and print the sum of their squares so we implement it as follows we say int sum equal to 0 and num we read num from c in then we say sum plus equal to num into num okay this is shorthand for sum equal to sum plus num into num and this shorthand is provided for you know typing ease but also internally it might sometimes be slightly faster because sum is loaded into a register and then something is added in place rather than loading two registers and storing it to a third register and then writing it back to the same variable okay so this may be slightly uh, more efficient to implement then you read num the second time and do the same thing so you can keep doing sum plus equal to okay this is not the property of plus alone you can do it with pretty much most operators so if you are going to print the product of all these numbers you would say sum star equal to whenever you can put a operator uh, ordinary operator you can put it in front of an equal to and that is called an assignment operator okay. or a compound assignment now how about the effect of this so you say int v a equal to 5 and then you say uh, int v b equal to v a plus equal to 2 this is called an expression with a side effect so if you look at the second expression we are computing v a plus equal to 2 that is an assignment that assignment itself has a value the value of the assignment is the value that was assigned to the left hand side VA after the expression 2 was evaluated and then the value of that whole assignment will go to VB again okay so let us look at uh, what happens if I run this code so I will comment out the other code VA equal to 5 a uh, couple of things we can try so 
So we initialize VA to 5, we say VA plus equal to 2 and assign the value of that assignment expression to VB. Then you print out both of them. So we get 7 and 7. So assignments sort of cascade, okay, the value that's assigned to the left hand side can also be taken out and assigned as an expression to another variable and you can keep doing this. Initializing variables, uh, but here is another form called the increment and decrement operator and that is a little more uh, interesting. So a special case of compound assignment is this syntax called plus plus VA or VB plus plus. Similarly VA minus minus and minus minus VB, okay. So if you prefix or suffix a variable by plus plus or minus minus and that variable is has a numeric type, by numeric type I include character, unsigned character, signed and unsigned ints, shorts, floats and doubles and longs, okay. Plus plus VA means increase VA by 1 and then access the incremented value whereas VB plus plus means access and remember the current value of VB and use it in whatever expression will be requiring it but then increment it before any further access. The second one may be slightly inefficient because the old value must be remembered in a register, okay. The way you would implement VB plus plus is you would copy the VB value, the old value into a register, you would increment the register corresponding to VB, maybe you would store it back and then if any expression wants the old value of VB you have to copy it from the register again or access it from that register. Um, so for example, uh, if we have this expression VB equal to 2 star star VA plus plus, I'll just copy it here. Now how would this be evaluated in some kind of a low level language, okay? VB equal to 2 star VA plus plus. So in very low level terms, what would happen is you would say load VA into say register 1, okay? Then you would say copy R1 to R2, right? Then you would say increment R2, right? Then you would say store R2 to VA, then you would say load constant 2 in say R3, then you would say R4 is assigned R1 times R3, so the old value remember, okay. And then you say store R4 to VB, okay. That would be the low level assembly language description of how this code would execute, okay, roughly speaking. You could reuse registers as you wish. Now this kind of auto increment and auto decrement, you have to use it very carefully because they are expressions but they cause side effects, they change the state of the memory. So let us look at uh, an expression here, so I would say plus plus VA and then I will print out both. So 5, I increase 5 and then assign it to B and then I print out both. So I should print 6 in both cases, so you get 6 and 6, right. Whereas if I say VA plus plus. then the value that VB gets is the old value of 5 but VA afterward changes to 6 before I can print it out. So I get 6 and 5, let me try to put this side by side so you can, okay. so you get 6 and 5, VA is 6 after incrementing but VB is 5 which is the value previous to incrementing, right. So that is the first expression. Um, now. The reason why you need extreme caution in using this sort of expressions with side effect is that C++ uses lazy evaluation or short circuit evaluation of Boolean expressions, logical expressions, okay. For example, uh, look at the upper part of the code. I declare variables VA and VB, I read them in and then I have VC equal to 5. Then I say if VA is greater than VB and plus plus VC is equal to 0, then do something, okay, it does not matter what it does. Later on I print VA, VB and VC, okay. So what does this say? If VA is greater than VC and VC on incrementing becomes 0 after incrementing, then do something. So observe that this is a Boolean expression with an and 
and suppose I find that depending on the input V A is less than V B. So, the first clause of the AND if it is false then the AND is false and short circuit evaluation means that C++ will not even evaluate the second logical expression. So, the plus plus V C will not even be executed whereas, if I give values where V A is indeed greater than V B then there is a chance that the AND may turn out to be true or false depending on the value of the second expression. Therefore, the second expression has to be evaluated no matter what V C is and so V C will get incremented. So, let us try a demo. So, in the first run I will input values where V A is less than V B. So, I will say 3, 4 and as you can see 3, 4 and 5. So, nothing happens to V C. V C was declared as 5 the same 5 is printed. Whereas, if I input 4, 3 then V C has been incremented just because of evaluating that expression. So, this is the reason why you should try to avoid having expressions with side effect inside Boolean expressions because the Boolean expression will evaluate in the cheapest possible manner and clauses may be omitted depending on whether the compiler has already figured out the value. Okay. So, and it makes code hard to read the behavior of the code will depend strongly on what the input values are to the Boolean expression and nothing is evaluated in full you see the code there in the boolean expression does not mean that all the clauses will actually be evaluated. Hmm. If it is plus plus then the original value is lost you get 1 plus the old value. If you say V A plus plus then the original value is remembered. Any, any other questions? Yes, let us let us discuss with a hub you know star shape. So, any any other questions I will repeat your question and then we will discuss it. Okay. So, that is the danger of uh, side effects, but sometimes you want side effects to write small clean expressions we will see that when we come to arrays these are particularly useful for indexing arrays. You have an index you want to increment it as you run through the array then plus plus is quite handy. Another feature that C++ provides for short simple coding is what is called a conditional expression. A conditional expression has the form a logical condition which is either true or false upon evaluation then a question mark then a value you want to return from the whole expression if the condition is true then a colon and then a value you want to return from the expression if the condition was false. For example, if I wanted to write down the expression for the maximum of two numbers a and b I would write it as a greater than b question mark a colon b. So, this is very easy to read if a is greater than b then a else b. So, it is an expression form of the if statement. So, in if statement you check a condition and then you execute one of two possible branches here you check a condition and evaluate two possible expressions. Okay. Now, another example suppose you want to uh, return a divided by b, but rounded up to the next integer in case b does not divide a evenly. If a is divided by b evenly then you want to return exactly over b otherwise you want to, to increase to the next integer. So, the second expression is technically type correct. So, you say a percent b greater than 0 if a percent b is greater than 0 that means there is a remainder and therefore return a over b plus 1 here otherwise it just return a over b. The one that abuses C plus plus conflation between booleans and ints says a percent b question mark a over b plus 1 or a over b. Okay. Now, note that there is lazy evaluation and therefore, you should avoid side effects like a percent b question mark c plus plus d minus minus. Okay. Here depending on how this first condition evaluates exactly one of those would be executed and so the side effect would be data dependent. Okay. Generally speaking you want the side effect to show up clearly in the code not as a function of input values. Yes. Same. That is right exactly one of them will be valid, but you will not know which one until you supply data. 
So it's good to make that explicit in if then else statements rather than use these kinds of conditional expressions to uh, write your code. So as I was saying there is actually a bool type. So old C++ used in to store boolean values and it still does but to the outside world to the programmer the ANSI standard C++ offers a type called bool and there are constants defined called true and false but it is only a very thin varnish on top of the same basic machinery because you know you can instantly lift a boolean value to an integer by saying int of a boolean value and old bad habits are still allowed you can say if 37 do something or you can even initialize a b val from 37 it will just automatically coerce to whatever true is and 0 is false okay. So overall value is unclear but you can use it if you think it makes your code easier to read. So 0 is false everything else is true so try to avoid this feature like the plague try to make your intention clear by actually completing the relational operator like a person b greater than 0 okay. Eventually someday someone else will read your code and find it easier to understand okay. So that uh, finishes the module on uh, expressions and their assignments to variables. Now you know generally speaking it is no fun if we are always writing straight line code so far we have a one main function and inside there is a sequence of statements which is just executed in sequence one after the other irrespective of what the data values are. So now we will get into controlling the order of statement execution okay. We have seen bits and pieces of this in uh, recent labs but now we will look at this formally. The first thing is that in the body of main that we already wrote there were not just one statement but a sequence of statements s1, s2, s3 etc. So statement colon semicolon statement semicolon and the semantics of that is very simple no matter what happens keep executing them one after the other and by convention 0 or 1 statements are allowed for uniformity and instead of just allowing this inside the body of main we will allow what is called a block. A block is nothing but a curly bracket followed by 0 or more statements separated by semicolons followed by close curly bracket. The body of main already look like that but we will allow nestings okay. Uh, so for example you are allowed to say something like this okay. you can declare an int value do some stuff and then you can open another curly you can do some more work there you can close that curly and then you can close off main okay. So what does that new set of nested curly brackets do okay. anytime you say a curly bracket followed by s1 etc up to sn that means that these statements look like one statement they are a compound block statement which is consisting of these individual statements executed one after the other. So anything you state here will just execute like that straight line fashion. So so far it seems to be serving no purpose but there is one interesting point regarding variable naming suppose inside this inner curly I declare int b at this point in the code you can access both a and b b is known from here a is known from there but once you come out of this curly at this point in the code b is unknown uh, technically we say that the scope of b has closed and b has been destroyed for all practical purposes the memory for b has been released back into the c++ runtime system and at this line if you use the variable b you will get a compile time error saying I do not know what b is okay. Now that is actually a feature uh, the reason is that suppose you are writing a long procedure or function and then other people will modify it you have one loop here another loop there suppose you start sharing variables across them then you might make a mistake about the initial state of the variable or what was the assumption when you entered into your block of the code if you conscientiously use these curly brackets to isolate big chunks of code from each other then variables used in one block will not be reachable by code in another block you will only transfer what variable should be shared so for example if you have here is the first block of code here is the second block of code they should only share a variable a but they use their private variables b and then the next the person who programs next on the project also declares a b these two variables are completely different they have no connection with each other although they are both called b okay. 
this B was destroyed when this curly closed and then a new variable B was created. Okay? So there is autonomy inside the blocks provided they do not share variables from the outside. Okay. That is one big purpose of curlies. The other thing is that if you code in a straight line like this then of course uh, curlies are not too useful. They become more useful when you uh, combine them with other constructs like if then else or while loops and so on. So for example if I wanted to re-implement my uh, say maximum of two variables suppose I want to store in the variable b the absolute value of variable a okay. So then I can start off my code saying int a b and then I can say read a from c in if a is greater than or equal to 0 then b is just a a from c in and then if a is non negative then b is just assigned to a otherwise b is assigned to minus of a okay. Uh, I could also so we have already seen a shorter way of writing it we can use uh, expressions okay. So I have already seen that we have other means of writing this stuff for example uh, we could say b equals a greater than or equal to 0 a minus a that would also give you an absolute value or uh, even in the if then else uh, world if you did not need a new variable b but you could clobber the old variable a then you could just say if a is less than 0 then uh, a equals minus a. This would destroy the old value of a and just store absolute value of a in a itself. Okay. So in other words the else clause can be missing you, the else clause is not compulsory. Now uh, here is another example stored in the variable c the smaller of the values of variables a and b. So we declare int a b c and read a and b if a is less than b then c equal to a else c is equal to b okay. So that is how you take the minimum of two values the else part is optional. And you can also cascade or nest any such construct in C++ you can indefinitely nest. Now statement blocks are also optional but they are best used for example so I could instead write I could do that without the curly brackets okay. But uh, the danger here is that this is visually a little misleading because you could say something like E equals some stuff and even if it is intended the else clause has finished okay. So it is generally a good idea to put curlies even if you think you do not need them so that any programmer updating your code are very clear about whether their new statement goes inside the curly or outside the curly you can avoid a lot of bugs in this way. Now as I said you could uh, keep cascading this or nest this okay. So nesting you could of course do things like if condition 1 and then inside you could say if condition 2 and then you could say else and then do something and inside here also there could be another if statement if c3 etc. So any kind of nesting is freely allowed not only that there is this form of a cascaded if which looks like if day of week equal to 0 then do something okay else if day of week equal to 1 do something else else if day of week equals 2 etc. Okay. Now this is within the language what is happening is you have an if statement and the condition is a test against 0 the so suppose this is statement 0 suppose this is statement 1 suppose this is statement 2 if the if condition is true then you execute statement 0 otherwise else this is another if statement starts here. So this is the if where the test is 1 if that is true you execute 1 otherwise there is another if statement and nothing happens if the last test fails okay. So when you cascade if statements like this it is like a spine of 
S's running down like a tree, but a sort of chain like tree. He is chaining the statements. Now, one important thing to note here is that suppose my test look like this. Suppose I say DOW is a variable which has value 5. And suppose here the test is DOW percent 5 equal to 0. Okay. Then actually two conditions are true, but that does not matter because as soon as the first condition qualifies say equal to 5. Say, if the first condition qualifies control comes down into S0 and it does not go down the right hand side. So even if multiple conditions in this cascade are satisfied only the first one will be executed. This will not be taken. Okay. So when you read a cascade of if statements always think of it in this form of a tree. Okay. Just like expressions the C++ compiler will immediately try to turn your code into a also a tree for the statements with the construct like if then else and why. Now for example suppose you are withdrawing money from a bank so you are writing code form for the uh, for the ATM machine. Uh, so you read from the keypad which will call C in the amount to be deducted. Okay. Now if the amount to be deducted is more than the balance then the bank should prevent you from withdrawing money. So it says account overdrawn and finishes the transaction otherwise it says okay successfully withdrawing deduct amount of rupees and then it reduces the balance by the amount to be deducted. Okay. You have to also make sure that the that same amount of paper money is ejected from the machine otherwise customers will be very unhappy. So the entire idea of databases and transactions in computer science deals with um, software that will ensure that either none of the two things happen balance reduction and money production or both of them happen. That is called an atomicity of a transaction you want the two things collectively to happen together or not at all. Okay. So we will not go into that of course in this course but that is an important area of computer science. Now, you can also write the then or else parts without curly brackets, but that could be dangerous as I was saying. If you write code like this, then even if it is indented, the plus plus n statement is outside the scope of the if, okay. only the first statement is inside the scope. Now we have also seen conditional expressions. Uh, we can rewrite the earlier examples as b is a greater than 0 a or minus a or c is compare a and b if a is smaller take a otherwise take b. Okay. If in doubt always use parentheses to make sure the expression tree is correct. And note that nesting quickly gives unreadable code. So A is greater than 0 test A otherwise minus A less than B then 100 plus C or C minus 100. So this becomes very very difficult to read very quickly. Also as I said before never use or avoid using side effects inside these kinds of expressions or code will be difficult to read. Okay. Now earlier I was showing you this uh, long cascade of if then else where I was testing the day of the week against 0 then against 1 then against 2 to decide what to do. Okay. Now that is of course painful um, to type and uh, that is why the switch statement was provided in C++ and other languages to test the value of a variable like day of week and look at various cases of it. Okay. So you could say case 0 then print Sunday, case 6 you print a Saturday and for any other value you print a weekday. Okay. So there are these special keywords let us go through them one by one switch says you are starting a switch statement based on a variable called day of week that variable is not allowed to be a float it is not allowed to be a string it can only be a discrete variable type like character or integer okay, or long integer and short and these values are possible values of that. So if in case day of week is 0 then do this in case day of week is 6 then do that. If none of the conditions are satisfied then do what is called default that is the syntax default always comes last in the switch body. Now one important thing is that is this break statement here right. The break statement takes control from this position to the end of the switch statement the break terminates the switch statement immediately without considering any of the options afterwards. Okay. So it is vital to remember to type break and it is a very common source of bugs. Okay. So the day of week can be character int long int short etc. If you do not put the break at this point control will just fall through to the next case and in fact the case will not even be checked we shall see that in an example. So if this break was missing then you would just print suppose day of week was 0 you would print Sunday but then you also print Saturday and then break. So remember to always put a break here 
and also if you want to declare local variables inside the case body always put curlies to shield those local variables from the code afterwards. So let me show it here. So if you have something like that and to do the processing for the case 0 you need to declare some variables like that put a curly around remember to insert a break so that if here someone wants to use vi again that will be isolated from that they should not be connected okay suppose someone forgets the break this vi carries over that is dangerous coding. So to be defensive in your coding always put curly in the cases as well unless they are single statements perhaps and if you are declaring variables always put a curly so that the variable does not survive beyond the case okay. So you need to kill the variable before that particular case is exited. Yes. Hmm. If you remember to put the break then it, that is how the language was defined. I will show you so let us look at uh, yeah so int val equal to 5 switch val so since I did not write the compiler for the language I do not know why it was defined this way I think it is for implementation cheapness um, so int val equal to 5 switch val case 5 c out 5 suppose you forget the break after that then you say c out 4 okay and then break and default is default okay we just print that out. So let us run this code and see so day of week is 5 test the 5 comment out that break and so on okay. So 5 is printed and 4 is printed even though DOW does not match 4. So this to me is a major problem with the language. Yes. So let us test it out right so you are suggesting that after the 5 I put a scope like this right I forget the break and I declare say int i x a right say like that yes and then at 4 what do you want to do another similar thing right this time we will say do not forget the break but I declare i n t i x again equal to 7 say. So I do not think the compiler will complain I think the compiler will go through flying. Now suppose you want to print i x here of course that i x will be this i x. No in fact even if you declare the 6 right outside here the local scope will dominate the global scope okay. So let us check that. So it is 7 not 6 the inner i x will take precedence over the outer i x. Yes no so this i x ceases to exist at that curly after that it has no effect this is exactly why curlies are very useful you make unambiguous the scope of a variable. Yes. Hmm. We'll discuss for later. I don't want to confuse the issue. Okay. We'll deal with for in the next lecture. Okay. So to me, uh, this is actually quite confusing. Why, in spite of DOW not matching four, I drop right into four. Okay. And the reason is that internally, and I was quite surprised to see this actually. And I've not coded C++ for a while. So internally, what happens is those case parts those are lined up in low level language like this okay and the compiler remembers the entry point into the various cases okay 
then when control enters the switch statement the compiler has something like this uh, compare the switch variable against the first value okay if it is true if it is equal then jump there all right and if you put a break here that is basically what's called a go to statement to the end of the switch okay if you forget to put okay suppose i check for the second value and i do a jump there in case of true if i forget the break so this is a break here there was no break here control just drops through without a comparison control flows through here and then goes straight down the comparisons don't happen one after the other unlike the cascaded if so the switch is not the cascaded if exactly okay so this is very important to understand so code conservatively use use the switch how it was intended to be used don't drop the breaks then things will be fine otherwise you might get all kinds of funny effects okay so that's the um, switch statement now so see if you can find out more about how this switch is implemented by looking up the web and try to explain what goes on by looking at the generated code okay in the sense that how web pages write about how switches are compiled okay. here's another uh, useful uh, application of the switch statement suppose we want to distinguish between characters based on whether they are vowels or not this time the false true is a feature okay this is exactly why the false true was allowed to be what it is which is slightly different from cascaded ifs so you say switch ch case a case capital a e and capital e all these cases you print it's a vowel okay otherwise in the default case you print it's not a vowel so in this case syntactically it's much shorter to write this um, just put down all the cases which should be handled by one kind of action and then put the others in a default so yet another switch example suppose we want to build a trivial calculator which can deal with a few binary uh, expressions so there's the left operand the right operand and the operator and we read them in sequence after that we print out whatever expression was given in and then we switch on the operator since the operator is a character it's a discrete type and we have four cases plus minus multiply and divide and then we actually do the operation and print it out okay now uh, if the operator does not match any of our standard operator supported then we say illegal operator and finish up so that's another simple switch example any questions about the switch so we have if then else we have switch we have cascaded ifs we have nested ifs of course you can nest a switch if you feel like there's nothing preventing you so now we will start with loops because remember last time we were doing some bit arithmetic on a bit vector or an integer you have to do anything you have to you know repeat it 32 times in the code to handle 32 bits that's very painful so loops will of course help a lot so of course the primary role of a loop is to keep repeating doing something for example you can say while true which is while condition you have to keep doing something so i will lecture clearly or slowly or you might say i'll remain quiet in class you so just keep on printing it without ever finishing if you want to quit the program you have to hit control c of course this is also no fun because insanity is doing the same thing over and over again with and expecting different results that don't happen so instead uh, we'll have to change something in the body of the loop okay so here's one other example of a loop slightly more sophisticated keep reading input numbers forever and check if each number is greater than the previous number read so the logic for doing that would be to remember the previous value in a variable called prev and then read the current value in a variable called car and compare prev and car and the important thing is that at the end of each iteration we will overwrite prev with car of course we don't have to remember all the values entered so far it's enough to remember just the last value now after that there is some mess here but i wanted to just introduce you to the joys of you know standard c++ programming now in the in the beginning the first number cannot be compared with anything before but by definition the first number is in increasing order the smooth way to implement that is to pretend that the very first number entered or the number before the first number was minus infinity or the minimum possible double number so in c++ you implement that by including limits 
and then you say numeric limits of double min okay this looks very very arcane but you will soon get used to it. This basically says of the type double find me the minimum limit okay. but you can also replace it by some very large magnitude negative number as you wish and then while true we keep on reading there is no end to this loop we declare double cur we read that in if cur is less than equal to pref then it is not in increasing order and so we print out not in increasing order otherwise or even otherwise you know we in any case assign cur to previous. So this is clear. Suppose we wanted to quit the loop as soon as the first violation happens, then after this C out, we can do a break. A break will leave this loop, but break we'll discuss in a little more detail in the next lecture. Now, another example is printing an integer in binary. This is slightly more interesting. Surprisingly, standard C++ will let you print a number in decimal and hexadecimal and octal base eight but there is no predefined library function which prints out a integer or a byte or a short in binary format but it is simple enough to implement. For brevity consider printing a byte number called num. Take the bit pattern mask which is set to 1 followed by all zeros. Let us do a bitwise AND between num and mask. If the result is non-zero then we print a 1 otherwise we print a 0. And then we shift the mask right so that the one shifts to the next position, then the next position, and so on. Right? This way we can print the whole number in binary. But we can do this more efficiently without using a mask by shifting. So instead of shifting the mask right, we shall shift the number left. So we'll use a fixed mask of one followed by all zeros, which will not change. Say the number is 107 in decimal, which looks like 01101011. The first masking action will take 1 followed by all zeros and mask it with that number and this will get a 0 because the leftmost bits are 1 and 0 whose and is 0 so we will print a 0. Then we will shift the number left so that from 0 1 1 0 1 etc it becomes 1 1 0 1 0 1 1 and the last 0 is padded from the right. This time when I and 1 followed by all zeros with the new number which has a 1 in the leftmost position I will get a 1 which is non-zero so I will print a 1. Then I will shift the number again and continue like that observe that the numbers I am printing 0 1 1 etc is exactly 0 1 1 and so on right. So this is how I can easily print a number in binary but doing this explicitly 8 times or 16 times or 32 times would be painful. So I can keep doing this until num goes 0 why should num become 0 because zeros are inserted from the right as I am shifting the number left eventually all these 1 bits will drop off the left end and the num will be replaced by entirely zeros. Okay. So let us uh, implement this and see that it works. We do not need many of those things. So let us say unsigned car, which is a byte uh, num equals 107. Okay. Then we say um, while num is not equal to 0, okay, we uh, print what do we print? We say num and this is an unsigned car right so we say 0 x 8 0 that is the one with the leftmost 1 if this is non 0 then we print a 1 otherwise we print a 0 we do not print the new line because we would like to have the bits next to each other okay and then finally we print a new line let us see if that works out. oops where is the bug the, I forgot the shift right shift num left by 1 otherwise you got an infinite loop okay. 
So that's the number in binary. Right? Yes. Yeah, unsigned card. So in this particular case, it would be okay. Cool down. Okay, so here here's one request. If you want to make noise, uh, don't use institute property. So no desks, only claps. <laughs> but quietly. So, so if you declare unsigned or signed, it doesn't matter in this case because you're shifting left. If you were to shift right, then it would make a difference. Okay, nothing nothing particular to show. All right. So you just get into the habit that if you are doing bit mask operations, it's always safer to declare unsigned because only zero bits will come in. That's all. So that's how you print in binary. That's a shortcut until num becomes zero. So the the question was, what happens if the number has a zero in the least significant bit? So 106 is even, right? Okay. In fact, if 107 is odd, 106 is just zero in place of one there. So let me compile and run this. Ah, so that's an interesting observation. So, so what happened here? Okay, so that's good of you to catch. Yes. So, if the num is turned to zero, then there's a problem in the last position, right? So, how can we fix that? The last division turned into zero. In fact, if the number is a multiple of four, then we are in even more serious trouble, right? So suppose I say 16, okay, this is completely bogus, right? So what's happening here? So clearly this is buggy. Yeah, yeah. So so clearly, you know, let, let's clap less and think more, right? So so what what's wrong with this piece of code? We need to understand the word size and continue going. So the test is wrong, right? So we can change the test. How do we change the test? So we could just say, you know, because I know the input is an, a byte, we'll just go eight times. Okay. So we can say int step equal to zero, okay. and then we say while step less than eight, and then we can increment step. Right. So that should do it. So next example is even more interesting. So suppose I want to raise a number to an integer power. So we are given a double precision number called base and we are given a non-negative integer power int pow say and we want to find base to the power pow. Now we will look at a simple and then a more efficient version. So, so we initialize a variable called answer to 1 and to do which is the number of multiplications to do to pow and while to do is greater than 0, we multiply answer by base which you can either write as answer equal to answer star base or answer star equal to base and to remember that we have finished off one of the multiplications we decrease to do by 1. So minus minus to do and we do that clearly this is correct. So this is obviously correct but it is interesting to prove the correctness to ourselves by using what is called a loop invariant. Okay. So initially answer equal to 1 and to do equal to pow. Now you can convince yourself that after any number of iterations this quantity answer into base to the power to do is base to the power pow. There are multiple variables so look at it very closely while keeping quiet. Okay. So this is a formal statement of what the loop does. So the statement is that iterations do not change this relationship between variables. Okay answer into base to the power to do is base to the power pow. Initially answer is 1 and to do is equal to pow. So clearly initially this condition holds. Every iteration to do decreases by 1 but answer is multiplied once by base. So every iteration this expression remains true and finally to do becomes 0. So base to the power to do becomes 1 and so answer has to become base to the power pow. Okay. So the number of multiplications involved here is exactly pow. I take answer and multiply it power times by base. Okay. Now there is a much more efficient way of doing it and it is called the doubling method. To understand that let us consider a special case where pow is a power of 2. So let us say pow equal to 32. 
instead of writing out base into base into base 31 times, 31 multiplications like we are doing effectively, we can now write a variable b2 for base squared and instead of using base ever again we can say b4 is b2 into b2 that gives me base to the power 4 then I find base to the power 8, base to the power 16 and my answer is base to the power 32 okay. So and this cost me only 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 multiplications instead of 31 multiplications okay. So it is about log 32 multiplications. So how can I implement this uh, for the general case where the power is not a power of 2. Suppose power equal to 29 and imagine that 29 is a byte so we can uh, write down things in brief. We can express 29 as some sum of some powers of 2. So it is 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 1 that is 29. Therefore my answer is base times b4 times b8 times b16. If I computed all these powers of 2 I can put them together with a few more multiplications to get base to the power 29. So now let this variable bx take values 0 through 7 this time you know, stepping up from you know, from the least significant end to more significant bits okay. We keep doubling as before and if the bx bit of power is 1 we include the power in the product otherwise we do not it is very simple right. I, I will compute I can compute b2 or base to the power 2 on the way but I will just not multiply it okay. If, if the bx bit of power is 1 then I do multiply it. Now we already know how to get a bit by using val times 1 okay. So this will be a much faster code so unsigned int this time we need an unsigned because we will be shifting right okay. Unsigned int to do equal to power double answer equal to 1 and term equal to base so term will be reusing term for all those values we will just go through them without preserving the old ones because you do not need the old values. While to do is greater than 0 we will do the following if to do and 1 is equal to 1 then we will multiply answer by term in any case we will double term and then we will shift to do so let me write down this code let me write down this code on board so we can track it with a value okay. Okay, the if ends without an else clause and then I double term this will do the same thing as that expression term star equal to term okay. and I uh, shift to do which I can also write by saying to do slash equal to 2 okay, I will half to do and I end the for loop. So let us now trace this code. Uh, on paper. So let us take the specific case uh, where of 29 okay. Let us say power is 29 0 0 0 1 1 1 0 1 okay. That is what uh, power is which is to do initially okay. Now the first test I do is to do is greater than 1 sure so I get into the loop. Now I take to do and look at its least significant bit by ending it with 1 and that is equal to 1 in this case. So what happens to ANS? So answer will uh, so remember initially term is equal to base so at this point answer will be equal to base right. After that uh, term will be doubled so term 
will become base squared okay and to do will be shifted right by 1 so to do will now become that okay this time after ending it in the next loop iteration i'll end it with 1 and find that it's a zero so answer will now be still be base okay i will not multiply but term will become base to the power 4 because term is squared right so term becomes base to the power 4 and i shift again so in the next iteration i get that 0 1 1 1 so this one has shifted here yes no see answer is updated only in the case that the least significant bit of to do is 1 otherwise answer is not updated fine so answer remains b in this case then term increases to b to the power 4 in the next iteration i actually find the lsb to be 1 again so now answer changes to b to the power 5 whatever answer was multiplied by b to the power 4 and term then become b to the power 8 and I shift to do so to do now becomes right again I find this to be equal to 1 so now answer becomes b to the power 13 8 plus 5 okay so what I am basically doing is I am choosing powers from here I choose this power I choose that power this power right this number so far is 13 it is uh, you know 8 plus 4 plus 1 and I have now shifted it up to that point so I have taken b to the power 13 meanwhile this becomes b to the power 16 term star equal to term in the very next iteration I get the last one okay so now I multiply those two to get b to the power 29 and then I shift it once again and I get all zeros and so I exit the loop okay I end up with b to the power 29 as I wanted but the total number of multiplications is much smaller okay so roughly speaking you can cut down the number of multiplications from linear in pow to logarithmic in pow okay so the library functions called pow in C++ and C they implement something even smarter than this inside okay so if you are doing it only once or twice then this is no big deal but if you have the computation of a power of a variable because you are solving some nonlinear differential equation and that is inside a very tight for loop which executes trillions of times then saving the number of multiplications is very very important okay you can get huge speed ups in your code by using this trick right so that is for general powers so that is what the faster code will do okay any questions about the progression from calculating uh, powers in the easy arithmetic progression way to the doubling way okay so how did we come up with the idea we looked at the loop invariant we said well you know we do not need to just decrement to do by one at a time we can you know uh, double the value or square the value rather okay rather than doubling it we should call it squaring so let us try out this code and see some uh, funny effects okay so fast power dot cc so I have a base variable which is 2.3 and power is say 10 I um, will compute two values the slow value and the fast value I initialize both of them to 1 in the slow method to do is pow while to do is greater than 0 slow star equal to base minus minus to do okay then I print slow and in fact I also print f it to a enormous number of significant values okay in the fast method it was as I said term equal to base unsigned to do equal to pow while to do right shift uh, to, while to do is greater than 0 that exact same code over there uh, I can either you know do term to do slash equal to 2 or to do equal to to do right shift 1 same thing then I will print the fast value again to uh, small precision and to large precision finally finally I want to compare the fast and slow values okay just to see if they are the same so fast equal to slow then equal otherwise not equal okay and uh, ignore the last two lines for the time being so this code is clear right I compute base to the power pow in two ways the slow way and the fast way okay. 
So let us compile this. Okay. Now I will run that and it claims the slow value is that to more precision it looks like this, the fast value looks identical and it looks like that and they are not equal. So they look equal, why are they not equal? So in the last two lines what I do is something that we have not covered and will not cover for quite a while but it is probably worth just you know uh, telling you what it is doing but then you know not worry about it too much. What I do is I take slow and I take its address in memory that is done by an ampersand operator. Then I tell the C compiler, I fool the C compiler by saying that although it was originally a double, the double is the same as the long, it is both 8, eight bytes. Okay. So it's a, pretend it is actually a pointer to a long integer and then print out that long integer in hex. Okay. In this case I take fast, I take its address in memory, I fool the C, C++ compiler into thinking it is a pointer to not a double but to actually a long integer and I print its value in hex. Okay, you can learn about this offline that is not so important. What we will see here is something else. So let me compile this code again. When I run it, you see it is not equal, uh, oh I did not save that file. So you see it is not equal because the last bit of the mantissa was different. Okay. So it is the very last bit in the double precision number. When printed out to a few digits of decimal it did not make any difference but the in memory representation is off by 2 bits actually, it's, this is 101 in the end, this is 110 in the end. So it is very small significant bits of the mantissa which were different and so the test for equality failed. Okay. So remember that when you speed up algorithms by this kind of numeric tricks, you may not get exactly the same value as with slow methods. Okay. And so any test of equality you do has to be corrected accordingly, you have to now test to a threshold. So I will continue with the next example in the next lecture.